The fastest growing continent in the world is Africa, also the youngest, and we have a great panel to discuss the opportunities, but also the challenges. To my left, Her Majesty Queen Maxima of the Netherlands. Then we also have the newly re-elected president of Botswana, President Masisi. Let's give them a warm applause and a welcome. We are also waiting for the president of Senegal. He's unfortunately stuck in traffic. <laughs> you should maybe think that was not possible in, in, in Davos, but um, the, as we know, the safest thing is to uh, walk this uh, small <laughs> alpine uh, village. As I um, um, already mentioned, um, Africa uh, has um, huge opportunities. Seven out of the 10 fasting, fastest growing economies in the world is in Africa. In a few years, Africa will have the largest workforce in the world, and 60% of the population in Africa is under 25 years old. So imagine all the jobs and skills that have to be developed in the years to come. But we also know that the young workforce, entrepreneurial spirit, if you have access to education, if there is financial inclusion, it can also create necessary growth and it can lead to prosperity. But there is also a fact that in Africa, you have pockets where we're very far from being on track on the sustainable development goals. And we know the overall goal by 2030 is to eradicate all extreme poverty. African leaders are taking new steps to also make Africa more competitive. One of them is to establish also a free trade area in Africa. It will be really, really quite remarkable. The combined GDP is more than 2.3 trillion already in Africa and a population of 1.2 billion. So uh, let me start with you, Mr. President. This um, customs union or the free trade market in Africa, how powerful is it going to be? Is it also a reflection of a new leadership thinking in Africa that uh, trade is more important than aid? And um, is there such a win-win thinking? And when will we see this? How big will it be? And what are the obstacles? Thank you very much, and um, I'm pleased to be here. But uh, getting right into the subject matter, um, all you've said about Africa is true. What I would add to it is that we perceive, we, I mean the leadership of Africa, the people of Africa, we perceive these numbers as opportunities, and we'd want to turn around whatever challenges are associated with these into opportunities to propel growth and spread wealth and success. There is a new leadership emerging in a number of countries in Africa that have hitherto not been known for some of the stellar works that are being undertaken now. Um, if you look what's happening in Ethiopia with President Abiy, and by extension, his influence in the region, you know, the peace deal he had with Eritrea and the net benefits that we derive out of that. We all hope that it would spread to Somalia and the Horn of Africa and uh, the peace dividend would yield the growth that we want. Africa, not only is it a, a young, vibrant continent, it has it's a repository of most of the world's resources, natural resources. And those need to be exploited responsibly and with the prime intention of having the Africans benefit out of those. So there's some level of responsibility that we'd expect from venture capitalists who want to make a return on their investment in, in such countries. 
uh, clearly, when you look at the fact that 60% of our population is under 25 years old and generally fairly well educated or educated enough to be retooled and retrained, with digitization going the rate it's going and the governance ecosystems that support it, wow. This continent potentially presents the most powerful workforce there's been in our lifetime. And so if we take a very optimistic look at that, we feel a certain sense of urgency in coming to WEF and engaging with those who have the way and the means to help us unlock this wealth so we realize our global goals and as stated in the SDGs, including our continental goals as stated in, in Agenda 2030. So uh, I'm here to confirm, though I'm President of Botswana, uh, on behalf of the other African countries, including President Marquis Sal, we're here, we subscribe to the African continental free trade area. And we have full confidence that when we increase the intra-Africa trade, it will be a means by which we grow and reach the world. In the same way, we also want the world to reach us. So trade would be a means by which we grow our wealth and we improve the lot of our people. Thank you. Thank you. That was, um, I think, clear visions uh, for Africa, and also for your country that is one of the most successful ones when it comes to the economy coming back to that. Um, Queen Maxima, in 2009, you were appointed the UN Secretary General's Special Advocate for Inclusive Finance for Development. And I think we all know that if you don't have access um, to financial institutions and if you don't have access to banking, uh, it uh, is also very hard to see real development happening. In the past few years, we have seen also positive development in the African region when it comes to connecting people to formal financial services. In many ways, I have to say, when I looked at the numbers last night, you have been extremely successful in your job. I have seen that Africa has almost doubled the amount that have been connected to financial services from 23% to 43% between 2011 and 18. So what steps should be no taken to even accelerate this because we are on the right track? First of all, uh, thank you for having us and this issue here uh, at this panel and also talk about Africa because I think it is a continent we should be looking uh, going forward. The growth in financial inclusion has been amazing. Since 2011, we've actually given more access to more than 1.2 billion people globally to financial services. And this has, of course, been driven by mobile banking, you know, the potential that you can actually, with your handheld, be able to have access to payments, savings, credit, microinsurance, uh, even having budgeting systems when you have a little bit more of a smartphone. So that has been really revolutionary. Um, this has not only created growth uh, in GDP, but it also has been helping us to reduce inequality. So we know that financial inclusion is not only pro-growth, pro but it's also pro-poor. It gives people, above all women, agency and control, which I think is something that we need to say. And we know we're investing in women, we are going to be investing in the development of a continent. We had an analysis um, that in Ethiopia, if mobile money really takes off by 2025, we could increase GDP by 10% and create 3 million additional jobs if we have digital financial inclusion. And there's one thing if you tell me about all the figures of this new youth coming in into the workforce, uh, the one thing I would be saying, oh my God, we have to create jobs, jobs, jobs. We will not be able to create those jobs if we do not have the infrastructure of having an inclusive digital financial system. How do we build upon this? First of all, We've got m many strides, but still from that 43% is the global financial inclusion. Now, if we look into the mobile money side 
only 21% of adults actually have a mobile banking account in the total of Africa. So we really need to grow. We need to do a lot more work. What, and actually, the ones that are actually lagging behind are the poorest percentiles, women, and the rural. So those are the three, probably, groups that we will have to be looking a lot more in the future. What do I need? I need better connectivity. Because even if everybody thinks, ah, everybody has a mobile phone. Well, it's not really true. Um, the 4G coverage in Africa is 7% of total connections. 7%. Only one-fourth of the whole African population uses mobile internet. And only 44% of the population has mobile subscriptions. So it's not only having that mobile phone and having the connectivity, but the reliability of the connectivity is also very important because I'm going to be sending money back to my mother in the rural areas. The moment I'm sending that money and the connection is gone, you know, the trust of that system is going to be gone. So the reliability needs also to be there. So connectivity is a very big issue. <clears throat> The other big issues, and we're working uh, very close together with the World Bank uh, in a system that's called ID4D, which is basically promoting national, unique, biometrical, di digital IDs. Without that, because of KYC issues, we cannot bank, uh, open bank accounts. We cannot facilitate for your governments to actually do proper uh, government to people payments in the form of subsidies, in the form of, sort of you know, stipends. So we need to really have these national IDs. Today, one billion people around the world do not have any ID, and half of them are in Africa. So if you look about sort of 1.2 billion people right now in Africa, and 500 million do not have an ID. So these are types of you know, public goods that we really need to have going forward for us to make this come true. And of course, we need to have to make the regulatory changes for us to allow these innovations to happen. And for that, we've been working very closely to, with many other central banks and ministers of finance to actually make those uh, new innovations. Um, very important issue, we will need to invest a lot in women and, uh, and focus a lot on women, what their needs are, and also on the smallholder farmers in Africa, which need at least $55 billion uh, additional of uh, financing yearly from now on. Thank you. Thank you. I think this is such a good progress that we uh, need a, a great applause for that. I, I was thinking, uh, listening uh, to the Queen, uh, Her Majesty, uh, Mr. President, um, where does uh, Botswana stand on this financial uh, inclusion? Um, are you happy where you stand? What, what, is your, what are you going to deliver uh, in the next period as President? Well, um, Botswana is progressing at a fairly rapid pace. Uh, we, are, 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 we have a national broadband strategy that's in place. Uh, we have uh, internet connectivity, the um, optic and the, the, the backbone is, uh, uh, is spread enough to cover the whole country, but we are lacking in covering the individual homes and businesses, which is the last mile, and that's what's going on now. We are committed to ensuring there is connectivity, irrespective of geography and gender. And we also committed to making sure that we bring the price down yeah. because there's no use in having all this and people can't afford it and don't use it. We are also committed to the innovation and providing local solutions by the development of apps and, uh, that are relevant to what we do. But uh, in terms of our progress, we are accelerating it by putting money in the right places as of this financial year. This is my first real term. You know, the, the last little bit is inheriting. And we just went to an election. We have a manifesto. We have a midterm review of our development plan. And we are realigning it because our quest and determination is to increasingly move away from the resource base of our economy to a knowledge-based economy. And so we're building the ecosystem to enable that. And connectivity, access, cost uh, are major issues. Fortunately, um, there isn't such a big divide between men and women or male and female with respect to access to connectivity and or technology such as uh, mobile telephony. 
but we do have a problem with uh, rural urban, mm. uh, yeah. particularly that Botswana is quite vast and uh, sparsely populated. Uh, but uh, these are challenges that we're quite determined to face head on and uh, watch the space. So Your Majesty, um, Herring know also uh, what the President said about his vision, it's his first uh, full term. Um, looking at also the fact that, uh, as you said, 1.2 billion people have during the last years uh, been connected and they're included in um, also being financially uh, connected. But there are still um, big uh, challenges moving forward. I think there's only 7% in Africa that are connected. I think mobile, mo mobile, mobile users, mobile, money. Uh, yeah. mobile internet users. Yeah. Mobile internet users. Which is a classification. Users. That is then uh, also prerequisite for doing financial yeah. transactions yes. and etc. Well, you can still or do wiring. it in a USSD, I mean, in an analog phone. But then the variety of things that you can do is much more limited, limited. of course. So my point is uh, if we're going to reach uh, the ambitious goals and the sustainable development goals, we can uh, mobilize governments, but I guess we also have to have the powerful private sector on board here. So I wonder, Your Majesty, uh, how much are you relying on the private sector to really also meet um, the goals um, in deepening financial inclusion? Yeah. Yes, I mean, first of all, I, I, my title is Financial Inclusion for Development, and, and, and when I say development, is, this, is, this is something that I need to empower people to uh, increase their income for themselves. So it's not only the big private sector that is sitting here in Davos. Uh, when we are actually giving people, f or they, we financially include them, it's good for their own businesses, the all, all small sort of little uh, sector. So, um, for example, in Tanzania, uh, um, farmers, when they've actually given money mobile, money, uh, mobile money based insurance, they increased their income by 16% by reducing a lot of the financial losses they actually had. The same thing, um, we've actually seen a mobile health provision. I mean, right now in Nigeria and in, and in Kenya, we've been able to give health insurance to people that before never had it. Most, uh, then also SME credit to a lot of, you know, clinics, they were very small, by increasing their efficiency. So in the whole, I mean, the whole continent, we need to have this as a way of increasing efficiencies of small businesses. And that also I call the private sector, because those are going to be the ones that are going to be creating the jobs and the employment that I know in your country of birth and in my country of birth in the Netherlands, 70% of employment is created by the SMEs. It's not created by the very big firms. So that is one thing. We need to increase efficiency and the potential to productivity of all the firms in the future in Africa. That's one thing. At the same time, there's a big role uh, uh, for the very big firms to play um, because they're key to improve the use cases. There's no, um, in the sense that, for example, a very big bank uh, or a telecom uh, mobile operator are a very good ally for me to actually start learning and what does a woman need from a banking account. They don't need the same saving services that I need in the Netherlands. They will need a completely different saving services. Uh, or the same thing goes for insurances, or the same thing for credit. So um, we need to really look at the customer needs and be much more customer-centric. So I need private sector to be very uh, um, observant about you know, which are the, their customers and actually try to translate that in good services. Two years ago, uh, here in, in Davos, we formed a group of 10 CEOs of 10 big companies, uh, mobile telecom operators, uh, consumer companies, banks, uh, internet companies. And what we did is, you know, none of them can, could actually do it by themselves. And the, all of them have presences in Africa, in Asia, etc. So we said, you know, how can we actually um, team up and partner to really do the things at the scale that we need. Because each one was doing something and you know, one reached 20,000 farmers here, the other one reached 10,000 merchants here, but actually that's really not gonna make the change. 
So, um, a company, for example, Rabobank, which is the uh, Dutch cooperative farming uh, bank, together with MasterCard, are now teaming up together to basically bankrise the whole value chain in six different countries in Africa. Mm. I mean, reaching a million farmers. In uh, November, I was in Pakistan, and uh, there's uh, Unilever and PepsiCo with Telenor, from your home country, and what they're going to be doing is they're going to be digitizing all the merchants in which PepsiCo and Unilever touches upon. Of course, for Unilever and PepsiCo, that means you know better income because that means they will actually have better inventory management with all these merchants that actually have to sell to. But at the same time, one these micro merchants have actually access to these transactional digital accounts, you will have to see, you can actually see how much they're actually transacting and they will actually have access to credit. Well in turn will actually mean more capacity of buying their products. So it has to be commercially viable. This is not a CSR issue anymore. We really need to bring the insights to these big firms and also for them to lead by example and by partnering, being able to help each other to really make uh, these customer-centric products that actually would actually deliver the, the you know, or actually uh, uh, cater for people's needs, change their lives, and actually increase, of course, the business potential of these firms. So um, I would say it's extremely important. We need a lot of the leadership of the CEOs and the local CEOs, because um, uh, sometimes I get to the countries, yes, that's what my global CEO sort of said that I should do. But, you know, for me, it's a little bit more difficult. Well, you know, we need a lot of long-term vision. And um, I think and we need to know this is not CSR. This has to be commercially sustainable. Otherwise, we will not be able to reach the scalability we need. Thank you. Mr. President, I, I will let you uh, comment on, um, on what Her Majesty uh, just said, but I would also uh, add a question to you because we know that national resource mobilization is also very important. We have to mobilize the private sector more, but it has to also be uh, uh, commercial uh, interesting. But uh, we know that if you look at uh, the taxes uh, and the VAT that is collected in Africa and you look uh, at the amount compared to GDP, it's pretty low. Um, any reflections uh, from your side, because now you're constructing this um, African um, internal market, but um, are you looking at also how you can uh, mobilize more resources um, locally in different countries that can then be invested in making Africa more ready um, on the skills, better education, and also better uh, infrastructure? You know, there's a whole raft of things that we need to do and do better. Uh, one of them, I'll readily admit, is to uh, maximize on our efficiencies of um, revenue management and generation. Uh, aside the obvious, I mean, there are some cases where th there's obvious uh, leakages that take place. Those, those are given. They've got to stop. Um, tax collection, you know, the determination of the amount of tax, the type of tax, public education, so that people are willing to pay tax and people appreciate the benefits of paying tax because they actually see the benefits that accrue out of resources raised through tax by the road being built, the infrastructure being put up. And so the whole lot of variables of efficiency that we need to get to, including on the delivery side and the part of government. I mean, when you, when you cut out a whole lot of challenges that many countries face, um, we would yield better and faster development. Now, uh, with respect to our commitment to the African continental free trade system, the first thing we've demonstrated, and which I hope we would stick to, is the political resolve and leadership required to attain that. The next would be the political will and resolve to create the ecosystem for it to occur. Um, you know, the, the, the legislative uh, uh, government governance required, including the relations between countries in terms of, you know, permitting and enabling uh, such trade. Many of our borders are 
totally artificial. And if many of us perceive um, tariffs as a means to generate your own development without being creative and innovative, it will fall flat. Africa hardly trades with itself, and yet there are so many goods and services required. We also need to ensure that we utilize digital technology, digitization, to promote efficiencies within firms which will raise their revenue base and they would use to invest in doing other things. And so I can completely align with the, you know, what the, the Queen is saying and can confirm that, at least speaking for my government, uh, you will not find us wanting in terms of our commitment to use our tax revenue to create the infrastructure necessary to attain the SDGs. I think I, I very much agree on what the President said, but um, we've been always talking about the resource, uh, natural resource mobilizations, and um, certainly from a fiscal perspective, uh, I think one of the most difficult conversations I've been having with a lot of ministers of finance around the world is just that, is the process of formalization uh, of merchants, of businesses, of uh, you know doctors. Teach. I mean, it's it's really a very tough uh, nut to crack. And 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 I don't want to say this lightly. We've actually just uh, written a report uh, from the World Bank for one of the G20 meetings, and. You know, these processes, first of all, you have to give them manners for them to pay that are actually formal, right? So in that sense, having the backbone of our digital financial system is key. Without that, mm -hmm. we will not be able to have a good process of formalization. Number two, there has to be something in it for them. I'm not going to pay those taxes if I don't have anything in return, because maybe the road didn't pass right through his area. So, <laughs> so he needs to have or some kind of access to credit, by formalizing of some kind of other attractive uh, uh, thing for him to have, for him to say, yes, I want to be formalized. Or he basically, he gets much better sales to a big company because he's been able to produce that. And if he doesn't do it formally, he will not be able to access that market. I think we have to start thinking in the sort of what does a micro, micro of a farmer or micro merchant or a small industry need, uh, 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 finds it attractive to be formalized. And the other big issue is, and this is something that has been also very tough um, in, in my whole work, I have to say, is that whatever we're saying, digital financial services, and it seems so technical, so sexy, we have to compete with cash. And competing with cash is quite a difficult thing. You have to be extremely, seemingly cheap, even though we know that cash is not cheap for people. It does have a cost, but they don't realize it. We need to be flawless. We need to be extremely private. You know, you have the cash, nobody sees it, so you know, it needs to be completely private. So there's a lot of characteristics that actually cash has been having. So also all the regulatory and all the, all the laws have to facilitate digital financial services in a way that we can compete with cash. I think these are the issues that, you know, if you have governments that actually have, uh, you know, a vision on this front, we can really come up with ways of actually doing that. But if we do not have that holistic approach, it will be very difficult to have a successful formalization mm. process. No worry. Uh, good points. Uh, when I was foreign minister in the country you mentioned, Norway, we launched a development program that was called Tax for Development. So we put some of the smartest tax lawyers and tax developers in Norway to do deals in developing countries, especially in Africa, and build a better tax collecting system. And what you saw is when people start, even with small taxes, they're also much more conscious about how the government uses the money. Yeah. Uh, because this is your money that you're paying, and then of course you want also good education, you want good health care um, for um, your uh, children. And what we also saw, and this was one of the paradoxes, is that in many places you see that there are exceptions from paying taxes. And for example, big landowners didn't have to pay tax on their land, but small farmers had to do. And these are also paradoxes that, of course, have to be uh, addressed. Another topic that is, of course, a critical one is related to better governance. 
Because if you see the World Bank's numbers, we see that in many African countries and also in many developing countries, and some developed countries even, we see that uh, corruption and bad governance is really stealing money uh, from the people. In some countries, its numbers are like 10, 20 percent. So, uh, Mr. President, um, do you feel that Africa is on the right course here? I think also with more financial inclusion, less cash, and more money that are wired through the system, its corruption is also harder. How big do you think the um, corruption issue is? And is there a real willingness uh, to deal with this up front? Because it's really about stealing money from people. Yes, um, I can speak best for Botswana. But um, even in the interactions that one has with their colleagues, at a rhetorical level, there is absolute commitment to have no corruption. But in reality, we do know that it, 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 it persists. And I couldn't agree with you more that corruption is, is basically thuggery. You know, it just, it's stealing. I mean, that's, that's what it is. And there's an opportunity cost to it. But there's also and a, a very real risk of making it endemic because if people lose faith in a system and they know the only way out is to pay or be paid, they will do it. So the hopelessness that uh, people feel uh, and loss of faith in the system of governance uh, will promote and sustain corruption. Now, because we are a developing continent, I think it's important that we take responsibility for our actions and ensure that we eliminate corruption and promote transparency. Democracy, as in the case of Botswana, is viewed very positively because, you know, with all its attributes together, democracy abhors corruption. The more you make things transparent, the more the population enrolls, and if you don't listen, they react and they boot you out. A good thing. But because we're developing and we're dependent on others, we would hope that, you know, systems and opportunities like we would have at the WEF and the UN and other international uh, bodies and institutions would help us to also ensure that the big corporates that engage with us are also committed to not promoting corruption, because it's a two-way street. Some of the most, uh, you know, uh, documented cases of corruption have certainly been uh, a pain to note that a number of very, very big firms were involved in that. I've been intrigued in my time as president, which is just under two years, whereupon when I visit you know, some developed countries, the expectation is that every CEO or senior executive of some big company has to see me. And in seeing me, everything is done. I'm totally shocked by that behavior. And I'm at pains to try and be polite and, and, and decline and ask them to go and see the minister or the ministry or some official because we really want to make sure we stick to a transparent route. So corruption is a problem. Corruption needs to be dealt with effectively. In Botswana, in my country, we're doing our very best. It's not that we don't have corruption. It's there, but we're committed to dealing with it wow. effectively. Wow. Thank you. Really uh, deserve a, a warm uh, applause on your commitment there, Mr. President. Uh, just um, uh, two reflections, and then uh, we're going to uh, go um, into wrapping up. I think the traffic jam uh, is, has to be very bad. So, uh, <laughs> but, but we're uh, also very privileged to have the two of you, and you delivered uh, amazingly well. So um, I think also the audience uh, agree uh, with that. I was, two things, uh, Mr. President. One, you mentioned this um, in your first answer uh, related to the peace dividend. Because even if we see a lot of positive developments in Africa, we still have conflicts and we have wars. But then we also have 
very ambitious and leaders that also go for peace. And you mentioned Prime Minister of Ethiopia, uh, where there was no a deal with Eritrea. There is also um, big transformation going on in uh, Sudan. Do you feel that the international community um, really is conscious enough and have a proactive policy when it comes to also creating then a peace dividend? When, when there is peace, there should also see results of this so we don't get back into conflict. And I think many of us are now following uh, Ethiopia, uh, this large, very important uh, country, if you can reflect on that. And then second question, last time we met, and that was before your elections, we met in Cape Town, uh, South Africa. And we also see that, of course, there's increased inter-regional and intra-African trade. We also see that our people from different African countries that do work in other African countries. And we have been um, quite surprised with xenophobia even happening in Africa. If you can reflect shortly on that. Um, it would be appreciated. Oh, thank you very much. Um, well, you know, uh, the, the positives coming out of Africa and its uh, leadership um, are slightly broader than just Ethiopia. I mean, uh, there's some laudable work taking place in Kenya um, and, and Nigeria. I mean, uh, part of the Nigeria magic was the the re-election of President Buhari and the, 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 the expression of confidence by his own people, most of whom abhor, abhor corruption, you know, and, uh, and the, 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 the opportunities that are, 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 you know, are in there are incredible. But we are convinced that Africa can do much more with much more help, not in the financial sense of giving aid, like we traditionally do, but the world can step up and tolerate less the indiscretions that take place in Africa, whether by Africans themselves or by Africans assisted by others. I mean, I find it totally bamboozling that the problems of the DRC continue to this day in such a civilized world. And yet, those who reap from the DRC are able to succeed through that maze of trouble to extract what they want from the DRC and use it. I think we need to address these things head on. It's important that we do that because the DRC's resources alone are more than enough for a lot of the world, certainly more than enough for Africa. I mean, talk of clean water. The DRC could be a solution provided to more than half of Africa with its clean water. Because when you look out from the sky, the clean water going into the ocean, draining from the Congo River, is about 70 kilometers in depth length. You know, that's a, a huge amount. And associated with that would be the power generation from, you know, um, the hydro um, uh, generation that we could get out of the DRC. Now, we, we, we have a number of worlds in Africa. And the country you mentioned, uh, which is my neighbor in South Africa, is no exception. Part of it Maybe historical, but it's still a development challenge that you find anywhere else. There are many people who have migrated to the urban centers of South Africa. And it's a mixture of both South Africans and non-South Africans. And as desperation sets in, particularly for locals, it's so much easier to be motivated to believe, sometimes falsely, that it's the foreigners who are taking your jobs. And South Africa being such a diverse society, you have a whole mix of people who hold opinions and sway the beliefs of people into promoting what has been called xenophobia. And I don't know if it really is xenophobia or criminality. 
And so we need to step back and really look at this uh, very carefully to make sure that it is properly analyzed and understood. But yes, we do have people who migrate from a not so well-off country to a better country in search of, of a, a better you know, quality of life. And that's a phenomenon that occurs everywhere in the world. Um, we, we have to make sure that we promote equitable distribution of opportunity, uh, bottom line. And it's all about governance, and we need the support of small businesses, big businesses, governments, NGOs, and a real commitment to ensuring that even if we disagreed with the policies of some countries, let us not harm the economy to the extent that that will be so. In this case, I speak of my neighbor, Zimbabwe. I mean, it's been going through debilitating sanctions as a country state for many years. We in the neighborhood believe sincerely the region, the country would be held better if those sanctions were lifted because we are the first to witness the experiences and ferocity of the effects of sanctions on ordinary people, women and girls. Now, if you have a situation like that, what hope do you have of you know, accessing financial inclusion at the very least? Thank you, Mr. President. I see the conversation has uh, been flowing so well that I, I'm, we're really coming uh, to the close. Uh, but um, at the end, um, Your Majesty, uh, financial inclusion, uh, you have had this role now uh, for 11 uh, years. Um, listening to uh, the president, listening to also uh, the prospects now with, with the SDGs. Any reflections at the end from your side? I, I guess you will keep on doing this until we have reached all the SDGs in 2030? <laughs> Not all of them. I think uh, <laughs> nobody, as I said before, nobody can do it alone. Um, it, it, um, just to say, financial inclusion is a means to an end. It's not an end in itself. Um, it's just one of the railways, I would say, uh, public goods that we need to have. Um, and if I, I'm hearing everything that's been saying uh, uh, today, but also in all my visits, the potential is there. I mean, we're having all this youth coming in, this huge amount of talent. They're all gonna be having some kind of access to digital uh, you know, means. And we can actually turn around things. I've actually seen countries that, you know, not knowing what a bank was, all of a sudden, you know, banking through mobile phones, they don't call it a bank. So we can leapfrog in many countries and use them, because I think you talk about resources in terms of mining. I, I, I'm, I want to talk about the resources of all these youth, girls and boys actually being entrepreneurs, entrepreneurial, and having themselves as solutions for their countries. But they need to have the space and the re regulatory space and to have some kind of um, backbone and infrastructure they can rely on. And I think that if we have the leadership from these African countries to permit this, and you know, myself and all the partners will be helping uh, and assisting to make those changes and, and to really bring in the private sector to help accordingly, I think that you know, we might actually have a very good success story. Wow, on that uh, optimistic note, thank you so much. Um, to Her Majesty, uh, Mr. President, I'm very thankful uh, for your contributions. I think also everyone really enjoyed listening uh, to you. Thank you so much.